Because I move around a bit at the festival, I put this on. Thank you. Uh, uh, well, I probably should have mentioned the Super Bowl this morning, but if I was in charge of worship with a son in Philadelphia, we would probably be singing, and God will raise you up on an eagle's wings. <laughs> <laughs> Epiphany, you know, Epiphany begins with the visit of the wise men. And if you follow all four gospel accounts, it goes from there to the presentation of Christ in the temple, to the slaughter of the innocents, the flight into Egypt. And some of the gospels include one account from Jesus' childhood when he was 12 years old in the temple. Matthew doesn't include that. Matthew jumps from the return from Egypt directly to Jesus coming as an adult for baptism. 30 years of silence. Depending on whether or not you include the story of the childhood, it's somewhere between 30 and 20 years, where we know absolutely nothing about the life of Jesus. Matthew picks up the story in the third chapter in those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John in Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you, and if you come to me. But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came out of the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, my beloved, with whom I am pleased. Let's pray together. Bless the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts, that together we might be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Why look? He's all grown up. Isn't that what they say? When my when my boys come home from Pennsylvania and people haven't seen him for a long time, they say, Oh, look at those boys. They're all grown up. <laughs> a few years ago we went back to Dexter, the town where we raised our family. And the funeral of a friend, and many people there hadn't seen the boys since they were in high school. And they said, Are these your boys? Why, look, they're all grown up. I just can't believe it. <laughs> and then, of course, the boys were somewhat dismayed when they said, Why, Jack, they come to look just like you. <laughs> <laughs> all grown up. When I realized my, my oldest son turned 50 this year. <laughs> you want to say, how did that happen? <laughs> like Kenny and I, the fellow fiddler on the roof, sunrise, sunset, quickly flying the years, one moment following another, laden with happiness, with tears. So, what happens when your adult children come home? My neighbor Floyd used to say that his children give him double joy. Joy when they come, and joy when they go. <laughs> then I know something of what he means. Now my boys are only grown up. So, but even when they come home, the tendency is to want to fall back in the old parent-child role. The desire to direct and protect, the urge to rescue, to, to try to fix their world for them, to try to mother them like we did when they were small, first of all, to try to tell them what they should do. And then we realize they are adults. 
they have changed, and our relationship has changed. Oh, the loving, the loving and the caring is still there, but it must be expressed in a new way. Oh, when they were little, our love could be a, an intervening love, protecting, surrounding them, shielding them from things that might hurt them. Now, now that they're grown up, that would be mothering or even worse, worse smothering. Now, that love is supporting and affirming and enabling and powering a love that sets them free. After these silent decades, Jesus reappears all grown up. In God for the birth, there it is. Fear of the visit of a wise man who would slaughter the innocents. Now, now, after this silent period, Jesus returns. He comes now to his second cousin, John, for baptism. He steps into the shallow waters of the Jordan River and feels that cold trickle of murky water running down his dark skin as John sprinkles a handful of muddy Jordan over his curly black Palestinian hair. River water dripping off his dark beard. And Matthew says, when he had been baptized, the heavens opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. And he heard a voice from heaven. And what did he hear? This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. All four gospel accounts and records record the event and the words in Matthew and John. It appears perhaps to have been addressed to Jesus or to John or to the crowd. In Mark and Luke, it's clearly directed to Jesus. You, you are my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. We don't know for sure who all heard it, whether they ever heard, others heard it or not. But the young man told Jesus, it was a word of confirmation and affirmation and assurance. Son of mine, you are loved. I'm pleased with you. But the young called Jesus, now beginning his ministry, it was that quiet, empowering, confirming moment in the depth of his soul. He knew who he was, and he knew whose he was, and he knew that he was loved and blessed. And I would suggest that that is how God comes to most of us most of the time. In the same way that God related to the adult Jesus in his day. God relates to us in the way that an adult parent relates to an adult child, not always intervening or protecting, smothering or controlling, but rather freeing and empowering so that we can be mature disciples of Jesus Christ. God offers us the same simple blessing that Jesus heard on the day of his baptism, you, you are my son, you are my daughter, you are love. That is all. But that is enough. Not that my adult child who calls home from across the country or around the world. The phone rings and you, you hear a familiar voice from Tacoma, or Missoula, Philadelphia, or Seattle, New York, or Gettysburg, Zimbabwe, or Malawi. We had calls from all of the above. <laughs> they say, how's he doing? Uh, not so good. Is there anything I can do? No, not really. I just need you to talk. And for a parent, the temple. Sure, is to try to fix things to make it all better. But the best we can do, and the best we can say is, you know what, kid? I love you. I believe in you. It's going to be okay. That is all. But that's enough. And I'm convinced 
that God comes to us in quiet moments like the still, small voice as gentle as the flight of a dove, more like the free love of a parent who sets us free to be the people we were intended to be. Now, let's be honest, we often wish it were otherwise. How many times, like Jesus in the wilderness valley of temptation, how many times have we wished that God would break in and solve our problems for us in times of testing and turmoil, doubt and weariness? How many times have we wanted to cry out, God, don't just stand there, do something, change things, turn the rocky stones of my life into healing bread. Get out of here and do something. But instead, God walks with us through the lonesome valley, silently supporting us in our struggle, simply saying, you are beloved. You are mine. I'll go with you in the wilderness. That is all. But that is enough. How many times, like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, we find ourselves in the Garden of agonizing decisions, difficult choices. We struggle in prayer until it feels like our life is being drained out in drops of blood. We want to cry out, God, take this cup away from me and do it now. But like Jesus, the cup remains. We face the time of struggle with them reassuringly. Hmm, you are my beloved son, my beloved daughter. I will go with you in the garden. That is all, but that is enough. How many times, like St. Paul, have we prayed, Lord, take this thorn out of my flesh? In the letter of the Corinthians, Paul, Paul says, three times I prayed, Lord, take this thorn out of my flesh. Now, we don't know what it was referring to. Some people think maybe he was epileptic, fell off his horse. Some people think it's because he was short, inferiority complex. Most preachers think he was some cantankerous church member. <laughs> <laughs> We don't know. Whatever it was, St. Paul says he prayed three times for it to be removed. And as far as we know, it never was. And what was the only answer that he got? My grace is sufficient for you. My grace will be made perfect in your weakness. My grace is enough. That is all. But it's sufficient. It's enough. How many times would we like God to come in and fight our fights and solve our problems and heal our wounds, save us from the holiness, just like when we were in nursery school? But instead, God sends his love as a quiet, gentle spirit, granting us assurance, confidence, so that we can move through life knowing that we are loved by our heavenly parent, and that that's enough. Chancellor Callis was a, a great pulpiteer. He was, for a time, the president of my home and water seminary on water. In one of Callis's sermons, he said, what is the plot of the Bible? It's the story of a love affair, the love affair between God and the human race. That's what the Bible is trying to tell us from the very beginning until the very end. Again and again, God is saying, I love you. I love you. God says it in creation. He says it in the giving of the law to Moses. He says it through the liturgy of the priests and the thundering of the prophets. God says it in the stable in Bethlehem and on the cross at Calvary. And God will say it at the consummation of all things in a moment yet to come, I love you. You are mine. You are loved. 
Huh. Jesus wading into that river with that chilling water and dripping down his spine. The water of baptism became a mark of assurance, a sign of God's grace, the mark of belonging. And so it is for all of us. I, know I should have asked, I, I guess, before I came around, do you all celebrate the renewal of baptism every year? You know, Methodists didn't do that. That was a fairly new addition to our liturgy. So it was back, I, it wasn't that long ago. It was the first year that I used that liturgy in worship. Never used it, we've never done it. It was a liturgy we invited people to come forward and to touch the water, to remember their baptism. But it was really a moment. I, I was really overwhelmed at how touched people were by that. And afterwards, one of them came up to me and said, you know what? I haven't thought about my baptism in years. Isn't it great to know that we are marked? in God's love. So it was for Jesus. And so it is for us. Maybe it comes in moments of silence. Maybe it comes in the smile of a friend. Maybe it comes in the words of a beloved man or in the breaking of bread and sharing of a cup. It is the word of assurance that is signed in our baptism and sealed in God's grace in the blood of the cross. Maybe it comes through the sound of music, a, a familiar hymn, the chords of the organ, or, or the stillness of silence. Maybe it comes in the view of nature, the midnight glow of the moonlit snow. Maybe it comes through the thundering waves crashing on the lake shore. However it comes, those are the moments when God seems to speak like a gentle dove. You are mine. You're my son. You're my daughter. You are loved. That is all. But that is enough. Well, Jesus is all grown up. He comes to his second cousin, John. He comes to the water. He hears the promise. I believe God comes to us in the same gentle way, making himself known and reminding us of who we are as the children of God. There's a wonderful hymn in your hymnal that uh, if I thought ahead, I would have encouraged to sing it today. But um, it comes from the poetry of the great American poet John Greenleaf Whittier. The title is, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind. The second verse says, O Sabbath rest, thy bell, O calm of hills above, where Jesus knelt to share with thee the silence of eternity, interpreted by love. Drop thy still news of quietness till all our striving cease. Take from our souls the strain and stress and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace. And then, perhaps for our troubled times and our conflicted, complicated lives, the last verse is the one we need to hear most. Breathe. Breathe through the kinks of our desires, thy holiness and thy law. Let flesh be known, let sense from tire speak. In the earthquake, wind, and fire, O oh, still, small voice of calm. May that still, small voice, like the wings of a dove, speak to each of us until we know in the depth of our souls you are loved. You are loved. That is all, but that is enough. Let's pray. <clears throat> oh, Holy Spirit, come and touch us. Hear 
there is a time of worship, but then surprise of moments of our lives. Let us silence and remember our listen and never again tremble in the power of the waves that are over us. Speak to us. Or still small voice of calm. Son and daughter, you are my beloved. As we affirm our faith together, we will stand and we will share together the nice and